Um, Gala Perez Kim, uh, she's an artist based in Los Angeles. Um, Gala, her artistic research focuses on social and political contexts that influence the representation of language and history. Um, and I would say that uh, she looks at how intangible things such as sounds, language and history have been represented through different methodologies in the fields of linguistics, history and conservation. And I will be joining Bella for the conversation as well. Can, um, I, can I actually start on a personal note, if you sure. allow me to do that? Uh, so I work in an arts archive and um, at this place, at this organization, we look at individual artist archives. So the goal is rather than creating this huge narrative about art history, you know, how to look at the fragmented histories or how to look at more personal, more individual histories within this larger big thing that we are talking about. And that was actually one of the reasons why I was um, very much drawn into your work. You know, the, the question of how archives, collections or museums, how can they um, reflect these fragments again, um, you know, rather than making these big statements about like, big narratives. And you actually, in your work, you push that question even further, in my opinion, if I say so, because you involve intangible things, intangible forms of culture, such as language, um, but you also think about the conservation issues around these ephemeral um, artifacts or ephemeral forms. So maybe we can start by speaking about where you actually started this research. Yeah? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll just talk about two projects that generally cover the ideas of linguistics and uh, the conservation. So my interest in Mexico started because, you know, in LA, it's north of Mexico, basically, and I had a lot of friends uh, from Oaxaca, who, which is the state in the south of uh, Mexico, and a couple of them were speaking in Zapotec, which is an indigenous language there, um, and they actually just start, you know, like, because I had a lot of friends and community there, I was very interested in the state, and, and then I found out that it was one of the most linguistically diverse sections of Mexico, or actually the Americas, and um, some of my friends, um, I said, like I said, spoke Zapotec, and uh, at work one day, they whistled to each other, and so then I was really curious to know how it was that that was a process of, you know, Zapotec is an oral, it's a tonal language that has been passed down orally, so you know, technically it has so much to do with your uh, mouth and your ears and not necessarily passed down through a literary tradition of your hands and your eyes. So I, I really wanted to figure out how to whistle with them. And so in order to do that, I thought that I would have to learn the language first and then learn how to whistle. So I returned to university to learn Zapotec. Uh, and I made objects in, instead of learning normal way. So I, I said, I'm an artist in the history department and I will make these objects to learn the language and make these translations from a spoken version to a whistle version. So this is actually all the verbs that are in Zapotec, but they're arranged by tone, so it's a sort of scale from the higher pitched verbs to the lower pitched verbs, so it makes some sort of scale. And this way it was so much easier to understand, uh, not necessarily to learn language by like subject, like color or dates or whatever, but instead by the sounds. Um, Can you also say a couple of words about what a tonal language is? Oh yes, yeah. so tonal language is kind of, it's like Chinese, you know, where the information is embedded within the tones of the language, so... Um, I guess... That's it. <laughs> so Zapotec also has four tones. Uh, so this is a sort of a note card, and here's a detail. Uh, it's Zapotec in the front and English in the back, with a, and in the, you know, so I spent two years learning this, and then the whistling part begun. So I took a lot of ethnographic, uh, ethnomusicology classes to figure out how to whistle properly. But in the end, I was not able to do. But in the process, I was able to find these texts that were describing how the air travels to your body and how your muscles have to change to change the way that the air travels and produces the specific language. So this is two two of. 24 different methods, like no finger, one finger, and two finger, um, and they all produce different sound or information. No? And so this is actually the end result of my two years, which ended up being a, a translation from the spoken Zapotec into its little tone, um, and I'll play some.
Okay, we, have, we don't have time for the whole thing. But can we have a stop? Stop! Yes, and then I made a score because I wanted to figure out if like actual instruments could play, and then it's not possible. But uh, because the range of the whistle is very specific, and then the 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 change from the really high pitched verse, uh, tones to the low ones is too quickly, so it's not possible to do. But the most interesting sort of thing that happened when I was learning this thing was that my teacher was writing the dictionary of the. Uh, specific variant that he was speaking, so he was actually deciding how this oral tradition was being written down, and they were using a Latin alphabet, which to me was so impossible to be able to represent these tones with A, B, C. So it's like, how do you spell <laughs> So he was like, maybe five H's or four H's, and so in a way it was how to, you know, try how it was this, this process of fitting a specific set structure of language into something that was not meant to be a written form, but like an oral tradition passed down uh, through your mom. So, I made these projects in Oaxaca, in Mexico, which was to make uh, individual versions of the language. So I went around these stores and asked people uh, to make their own translations of the signs in their stores. And so I just said, you know, how do you say this in Zapotec, and then how do you spell it? But by default, everybody started using a Latin alphabet, and I was like, okay, fine. Um, so here's here's some. Hello? Okay. Uh, but then I was interested in like how to separate it from a, a Spanish alphabet. Uh, and so I started looking at these like stones before Spanish came that the languages in Mesoamerica were represented. And here's where I got really into conservation because I really wanted to figure out how to handle these objects and look at them. Um, this is Casa uh, Jalapop, it's a very interesting stone. It's the oldest uh, text in the Americas. Um, Can I interrupt you here and ask yeah. a quick thing? When you were learning the language, you said that it took you two years? Well, was I still it? don't know, but... Um, <laughs> it was a <laughs> beginner level, maybe. Were you learning the language with one person, or were you actually conversing with multiple people? I'm curious how it changed the way that you learned the language as well. It was only one person. It was actually like very school setting, and then actually to produce that record, you know, it was... The, the title of the text was... Uh, came from very strange story that it was like a, a restaurant next to school that happened to have people who worked there from the same exact town as my teacher and I heard, I overheard them speaking I'm like, oh my god, I understand. And so then I asked them what, how, how to say the title of the thing and they didn't know how to spell it so they just came up with the text themselves and that's sort of what became the text. But, you know, going out of Mexico and LA there's not only one specific variant but multiple ones so I've been returning to Oaxaca a lot but um, but now I'm, I got distracted by this conservation thing, so I was like, okay, now I'm looking at the stones, and uh, I made this, this is La Mojada Stella, it was a, it's an undeciphered text uh, stone that has all these characters that nobody really knows what it means, so then I started thinking about different ways to understand the text that was now based on like a like, linguistic way, but another way of understanding language and here's four, four different ways that I thought about um, considering this rock in the text and then I'll go through them quickly. Uh, this is La Mojada Stella and its shape. So it's this box with plexiglass that you look through it and each plexi is separated by each individual sort of shape that I randomly picked. So like all the circles or all the squares or all the faces or all the like feather things in the thing. So you can actually like align this sort of backdrop image and then you can look at all the circles and find a meaning of that, no? Uh, then I made this Namo Harastella and its negative space. So in Mesoamerica, this is based on the obsidian mirrors. So in Mesoamerica they used obsidian mirrors to uh, sort of a, as a divination tool to find out something about yourself that you didn't know. And so the the background is a drawing of a obsidian mirror, so it's actually kind of reflective because the graphite is shiny. But because I was thinking, oh, I want to make an actual obsidian mirror, but it was too large and it was not possible because it breaks. Technically, not yet, but it's still trying. Um, so the the front is the actual shape of the stone, and all of the holes that you see is the parts that have been damaged of the original stone. So the idea was that it would be looking at itself in the mirror 
uh, trying to figure out what the missing parts were. No, I, I just had a question about the, the previous slide, actually. Would you like to, to play the video? Uh, not the previous one. Yeah. Not the video. Maybe. The, oh, the video is next. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Next one. <laughs> oh, this one, yeah, next. And then um, this one is actually uh, cousin works that got divorced in the show because there was uh, weird lighting. But this is a uh, one uh, drawing of the text in the way that the stone has structured it. So it's like a structured text. And then the idea was that put together with this uh, incidental way of making uh, random uh, random connections between the, the text. And also, when you see them together uh, like this, then you could see the set structure and the one that you couldn't control. Um, and then it sort of just moves. And then the text falls. And so I was thinking that eventually, maybe, luckily, somebody would be looking at it in a moment in which they would align somehow, but then it's like, oh, somebody has to be paying really good attention to it. Like, see when that happens. Um, I have a question about scale. I was wondering what you were thinking about scale when you created these two ah, yes. versions. Yes. Um, the, so all of them... To be originals. Yeah, there is a, the original is a one-to-one -one scale. So it's actually, this is a eight-foot drawing because the, the stone is the same size. Because I wanted to make this drawing, uh, that one over there, uh, because, you know, through the process of drawing, since it's so slow, I actually have memorized all of the characters and I know what they are. And so, in a way, I, I like thinking about the process of drawing as a learning process. Since this e is actually more interesting for me to look at this slow motion understanding of an object by looking closely. Um, and then... Oh, that's the end. What's up? Do you have a question? <laughs> like, ah, 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 how fast? You took us so much. Yeah, so then maybe I can just talk about the, the second part of this project, which was to go to the Babalwapan River, which is where this Mojave Stella was found. And I wanted to make, I actually sort of did, make a video of the riverbed of this river because, um, Oh, wait, I'm mean, there. There's more there, but here. Yeah. We cannot get that. Oh, wait, I was like, wait, there's more. Okay, okay. okay perfect. So, in the process of like looking at these stones, I worked with so many conservators, and then in LA, there's this ethnographic museum where I learned conservation because I wanted to know the method. And this museum had this like weird shelf that had all of these artifacts that had lost the catalog number. So, people there had no idea where they came from or what it was, but they still had all of these post its where they projected what they thought it was. So, for example, this mud ring had like this note that said maybe it's Africa or from Bali. Who knows? No? And so, I, I made this exhibition that was based on these projections by cu uh, curators and conservators. Uh, as a placeholder until maybe somebody could come up with a way to understand how to reconstruct it, but I really, maybe not possible. So, so you hit the original objects as well as their, yes. um, your abstraction or representation of yes. the same stuff. So, so they work in triptych, so it's a, the artifact here and then the reconstruction, and then the drawing is a record of them being together because once the show's over, the artifacts go back to the museum. So this one is actually based uh, the, the objects that you see on the table had a note that said it belonged to a ceramic. And the collections manager said that there was a collector one time who had the ceramic in his house and he put all of this trash inside of the ceramic and he donated it together to the museum. And so the museum, when cataloging it, it cataloged it together. Years later, the ceramic got lost. So everything that remained was this bag that said it belongs to a ceramic. So then I made a ceramic that makes it actually belong into it because the, the trash goes actually physically into the shape, no? I love the idea of an object belonging to another object. Yes, and so the, the drawing is actually them together. Yes. So do you feel um, there's some sort of a similar sense of belonging between these different objects that you are creating and the original one? Or is I, something separate? I don't know yet. I think that maybe it's just 
could be an individual belonging to me, you know, this is my specific shape, but I felt that because there's no original shape, it belongs to sort of whoever looks at it and says, you know, we have an experience together. Um, this is another one. It's just a grass that was attached to a larger piece of grass. So there it is. And then this is the mud ring that you saw in the beginning that has a wood fragment inside of it, so it was attached to a larger piece of wood before. Um, this is a fabric fragments uh, that were sewn into another piece of fabric to conserve them. So for me, it was interesting how the conservator, through the process of maintaining this fabric, made a new object. So he made this random pattern, and based on this pattern, I made a repeat of what a version based on his reconstruction was. Um, now, this is uh, two stones, and it came with a post-it that says, two stones found on shelf. Door stops, question mark? So somehow maybe it was these rocks in the office that made it into the shelf and became an antiquity. So then it, I, actually, I made a door, door stop and then we put the rocks in it. But actually the most interesting part for me of the show was the, the forms it generated because to borrow the objects for the exhibition they had to generate a loan form which they had to name what the objects were and the insurance value. So in a way it was like how are you going to assign value to something that you have no idea what it is. And through our conversations with the institution, we were able to rename, uh, you know, temporarily, I guess, name some of them based on things that I sort of projected or whatever. So, so for example, um, this stone on the right is called now Goonies Rock because it reminded me of the rock that, from the movie The Goonies where the guy looks through and finds the treasure. So then when it went back to the uh, institute, the ethnographic museum, now I it says Goonies Rock. Uh, center one is January's fertility belt because January is one of the curators of the contemporary museum and she said that when she was pregnant somebody gave her a grass belt that looked just like that so now it's her fertility belt. Um, and then I just put one random one that was called a one bag with crumbs in a post-it because for me it was so interesting how there was so much energy going into these museums uh, to maintain something that was not actually that for me was like a projection of value. So for example, there's, there's, they had this bag that had just breadcrumbs inside of it and I asked them like, why do you spend so much energy maintaining this object? And then the answer was sort of like, because maybe uh, it was the last bread of King something and then now we only have these crumbs. And so in a way to me it was just like, such a clear picture of the anxiety of maintaining this historical record that we actually don't have access to anymore. Um, so yeah, that's sort of what I mean. Quick question about these two collections. Uh, I believe one of them was a contemporary art collection, yes. the other one was an ethnographic collection, right? Yes. When you were dealing with the representatives of these collections, how did the negotiations go? Do you think they were very different? Oh, Anything yes. shocking? <laughs> yes, so these two museums, the ethnographic museum, the contemporary museum, they're actually part of the same college and they're one block away from each other and they never talk to each other. So in a way, when I was invited to make the show in the Contemporary Museum, I asked them for a letter to go look at the collection and then this is the way. And then when I proposed the project, the Ethnographic Museum was basically asking me, are you trying to say that we cannot maintain our collection? And which is a very valid question, but for me, one of the main questions that I have not questions, but thoughts in institutions is that we as a public uh, expect institutions to be able to maintain and be very factual about the collection when it's really impossible for anybody to really understand all of the stuff that is in the historical past, no? Uh, so I actually do think that, you know, looking at uh, maybe the, the context in which it, the, the practices of understanding a historical method from the time when the object existed or was formed is a really interesting way for me to uh, put into parallel with this like impossible, really official looking way. Maybe follow up on that, I want to say, or I want to go back to a word that you used uh, when you were speaking about one of the drawings that you made in relation to some of, one of these objects that you borrowed from the, the collection. You actually used the word record. And I'm curious, um, maybe? <laughs> So I'm curious, uh, maybe we can just go back to it. It was um, for this oh, particular yes, yes, drawing. Yes, that's right. Yes. So I'm curious if, 
how you circulate these words or when you circulate them, do you also play with these value systems? You know, is it a record? Is it a document? Is yes. it an archive? archival thing, is it an artwork, or maybe you're not interested in these divisions? No, 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 I think that that's also one of it. my interests is how the building around an object uh, defines what the object is. So for me, when this object exists not in a museum, it's like a reconstruction and uh, just like a receipt drawing. Uh, but in this specific setting, it's a sculpture. So I really, I am actually currently looking at a lot of contract law and uh, ways in which the legal system actually defines what objects are in the same way that as a sculpture uh, we I define material uh, shapes. No, um, yeah, but the drawing is just a record of them together. I don't think of it as a like it's a relationship between the three of them that makes the piece, but individually it's just stuff. But if I, if it enters a collection, probably that collection is going to determine. Yes, that's but system actually, well, no? one of the things that I was interested in with this work is how somebody was never able to own the entire thing. So in a way, a third of it, the artifact part, went um, back to the Ethnographic Museum, and then, you know, you only have two thirds. Yeah. If I may speculate, I would wonder <laughs> if your work could be considered as belonging to, to the object itself. Legally, because you know you're interested in these legal documents. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. just you know, thinking out loud. <laughs> that is very interesting. Yes, I mean I'm actually thinking about legal. Uh, if people in the afterlife have legal uh, say over their buried objects, because some objects have a like a not a finite function, you know, like objects that are ritual, ritual sites or objects from the afterlife, the function is infinite. So in a way, it, it's still ongoing today. Even if it's in a museum, it's still functioning as its final uh, purpose. I'm reminded that I have to be aware of time. Uh, maybe, can I ask one last thing? Uh, I have to admit that I knew about Gala's work for a long time, but it's this week that we met in person for the first time, and I had the opportunity to hear more about what you're working on right now. <coughs> Would you like to share a couple of words about oh, yes. what you're doing with the, the fellowship? Yes. Well, I mean, it's, we, I just started a fellowship at Harvard, and I'm, I'm actually looking at how these very academic ways can be uh, if other alternative ways can be used to represent a historical record, so I thought that it would be a challenge to go there to like the pillar of institutional knowledge to be able to argue with them uh, how to um, think about a different mode of like scientific thought or historical record keeping or stuff like that. Um, but for me specifically, it's mostly this question about the law and how to be able to make work uh, through regulation. To be continued. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, both of you.